Welcome to Inspirational Leadership. I'm your host, Kristen Harcourt, and I already started to have a wonderful conversation with today's guest, so I can't, can't wait to introduce you to her. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Michelle Johnson, who is a management professor, executive coach, and leadership expert, helping leaders achieve results through meaningful connection. She is an award-winning professor studying leadership and business communication, and her research has shown a clear link between a team's effective communication and its positive financial performance. Her new book is called The Seismic Shift in Leadership, and I just heard that it is an Amazon bestseller. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Thank you so much, Kristen. I'm really happy to be here. I can, I'm sure the listeners can tell in my voice. Yes, Kristen and I connected before we started recording and we speak the same language. Yes. And I think that the way you position it in the book has been done in a very beautiful way that is going to speak to a lot of different people. Um, before we start getting into that, and I think even breaking down the different areas that you talk about, and um, I just have to t- tell you as well, I just think it was so effective the way you brought in so many different leaders and got them to share their stories and real life experiences. I think I highly recommend the book and everyone will, will really connect with it. But before we even get into that, um, I got to know you more through reading your book as well and hearing some of your history and the work you've done as a professor. Um, but tell the audience a little bit more around your journey, your story, the pivotal moments that got you to where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. I certainly didn't think that I would be an academic, a professor. Um, I did go back when I was in graduate school and I got recruited by one of my professors um, who was a president of a consulting firm, which is what brought me to New Orleans. And I just found my passion. I loved the city. I fell in love with the city and I fell in love with, at the time, I mean, I was in my 20s, so I wasn't doing any consulting per se, but I was a corporate trainer and I just loved educating and helping people learn and grow. So I knew that was a real passion. I found that probably at the age of 23. And then the president and vice president of the firm said, you are way too young to have credibility right now. You need to go get a PhD. And I kind of went kicking and screaming like, oh man man, I just finished my master's and wrote my thesis. Do I really need to do this? And they said, yes. And they both had PhDs. So I went to LSU and and got my PhD in communication. And while I was, and then I moved back to New Orleans after a two-year residency. And and while I was writing my dissertation, I was teaching a business communication course in the business school at Loyola at night. So I just, you know, went in and went out, didn't meet anybody, but all of a sudden the dean heard about me and brought me in his office and said, I want to make this a mandatory class for all business majors. And I want you to be a full-time professor. And so I did, I was like, really? Oh my gosh. Okay. So there I became a professor and was able then to do both, which is really nice. It was a good, you know, I, I don't work the summers and I lecture two to three at the most days a week and gives me some time to be an executive coach. And, and also to still, I mean, I love my students, right? And they, and they they're, bring such energy into my thinking. And I feel like, and this is what the Dean tells me, he said, it's really cool, Michelle, because you, you, you coach executives. So you get to find out what's really going on in the real world. And then you get to bring it into the classroom. And then the, the students keep you young. And then you can go and help the executives on what the younger generation. So it really is a beautiful circle. Totally. And I I remember you talked about that in the book too, when people said, why don't you just leave that and do executive coaching full time? And you said, no, like, I don't want to leave that. And I completely see that because not only are you, are you hearing that, but I think there's something to be said about the next generation and them coming up. And that keeps you fresh and hearing their ideas and what's happening with them. And you get to be part of that impact. So how beautiful that you get to have that end to end, the impact on both sides like that. Yeah, really cool. And, you know, if you read the book, and thank you so much for reading the book, I I took a huge risk. Academics, typically, when they write books, they don't talk about themselves. And I really thought, and and it was a very intentional choice. I said, I, I want to... I want other people to see that I, that I, this is just not academic and research-based, that I had to go through these journeys too, that I had to fail and stumble and fall in order to get up and really grow and really learn. And I think that has, those struggles have made me a better executive coach and certainly better in the classroom. So that was a huge risk. Well, and one of the things that I think that you shared that's so important, and I see with 
a lot of the female leaders that I coach as well is sometimes where you feel like that you talked about this in the classroom and some of the learning that came for you when it came to connection and you're um, really communicating who you are is there's almost this persona of who you have to be and you recognize at the beginning you were being that persona and then felt like this, I'm not getting very good ratings from my class, from the class, but not only that, of course, you're not going to be energized the same way. It's going to be exhausting. And so I'd love to just even start there because I do think there's a lot of women and to be quite honest, it goes the other way with men as well, that they're feeling like they have to also live up to this persona of who they're supposed to be, which is inauthentic and it doesn't work for them, but it also doesn't work for their teams or the organization. You are absolutely right. And, and you are right when you said it's, it's men and women. So in this one particular year, which is what prompted me to write this book, three of my senior leaders, one was an interim CEO, one was a COO, and another one was a COO, female, male, male. And all three of them were getting pushed out of the organization, but for the same reasons. The female interim CEO was just doing what her former boss had done who had mentored her for 20 years. She was his right-hand person and he retires, she gets the interim, she's just doing what he did and he was very aggressive and very tough, but incredibly well-respected. So she's just emulating him. They bring me in to do a 360 to try to help her before she even gets the position. And then she never even had an opportunity to get the position because the feedback was not good. And that was hard as her coach to see that feedback. And, and, but then you realize she wasn't bringing her authentic self, right? And she was creating, because she was trying to be somebody that she wasn't, she wasn't leading with her heart. And, and that got, got her into trouble. Because what we're seeing now is that the real characteristics for, for leaders to be successful is leading with compassion. Now more than ever, showing people that you care about them as a human, not just as the results that they bring to the organization. So here she was running a meeting like boom, 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 very results oriented in a very aggressive way. And people are like, whoa, and this was pre-pandemic. Can you imagine now? And, and what, what emerged in the data was that she had created a culture of fear. And so what we need now is leaders who are leading with their hearts, right? Because talent is so hard to find and not only hard to find, but also hard to retain. So you need to recruit and retain. Well, how do you do that? You do, don't do that by creating a culture of fear. You do that by creating a culture of connection. And so that's what I'm trying to advocate with my leaders is, true connection, right? So what would emerge in the data, and you're an executive coach as well. So you know, whenever you begin coaching relationship, you want to go around and conduct interviews and figure out how this leader is being perceived, right? And what was coming out emerging in the data, Kristen, was that their teams didn't trust them. So in the very beginning, I didn't get, because I hadn't gone deeper yet, that the reason why their teams weren't trusting them is because they were so disconnected from themselves. And you're absolutely right. When you're disconnected from yourself or when you feel like showing up as yourself will not be successful, then what you do is you put this mask of perfection on and whatever perfection looks like for you, but it actually creates disconnection. So perfection, you know, creates disconnection. So that's what I'm trying to really advocate now that in 2022, leaders need to really work and make sure that they are comfortable enough in their own skin, that they're connected with their strengths, with their gifts of what they're bringing to the table, and then they can connect with their people. So going back, you said something really Powerful earlier. You, you had mentioned the, the part in the book that, that I say, yeah, I, I struggled in the classroom because I was acting like what I thought I had to act to be successful. So there was a disconnection with the students. You know, I was coming across a little bit too tough. Yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with tough. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. They saw, they, I think they interpreted it as a big giant B-I-T-C-H, right? Yeah. yeah. Because I, and that's not who I am at all. But one of the things you said that really got my attention was how exhausting that was for me. Yeah. 
because I'd walk in at the end of the day after work and I was so depleted because I had just spent hours trying to be somebody else. Right. 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 And that's the part that people don't realize, right? Because people can feel your energy. It's, it's more than words. It's one that they can feel as you're showing up. And, and I remember you've been saying in the story, like, as you started to be wearing what you wanted to be wearing, wearing your heels, letting your enthusiasm come through, which is who you were even sharing that you were a cheerleader at some point, which guess what? There's a reason why you did that. Like you're a high energy that's bringing all of that out. And so instead of feeling like judging yourself that that's somehow lesser than, and there's this version you're supposed to be when you own it, it's so beautiful. And I always say, as you own it, you give others permission to do the same. You are so right. I I almost forgot that I included the cheerleader thing, you know, in the book, I, when I became an academic at age 28 in an, an MBA professor, I just kind of pretended that there's no way I was a cheerleader. And I remember being at a faculty party and one of the guys, one of my colleagues had heard and he's like, oh, ha ha, I heard you were a cheerleader. I was like, what? (laughs) I mean, I I worked so hard to, 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 oh gosh, how do you say it? To cover pieces of myself, which I should not have done. I should have owned it and said, absolutely. Yes, I was. And you know what? It really taught me. I led pep rallies on Fridays for 3000 students. And I was in charge of that and didn't realize at the time that that would really serve me well in leading thousands of of students again as a faculty member. And and I I just wish I could go back and own it more. I was on a call recently with, um, I'm a part of the 100 Coaches Group, which Marshall Goldsmith, who's an executive coach, and he put together the top executive coaches from around the world. And we get to meet on a weekly basis and really try to figure out what are the issues at hand that are that our top leaders are facing and how can we show up as the best executive coaches. So I'm in this Zoom in a breakout room with one of my colleagues who I didn't know well. Her name is Charlene Wheelis. And she had written a book called just, I think it was um, You Are Enough. Her book is called You Are Enough. And I'm pretty sure it was an Amazon bestseller. I don't remember when she wrote it. And she was in this breakout room and we're sharing our stories. And she said, I am so proud to tell you that I've been a cheerleader. She's an executive coach now. She said, I've been a cheerleader my whole life. And here I had been saying that, but I didn't even cheer in college. I stopped it, went to college and learned how to, you know, discover boys and, and beer. And my days, you know, were over. She said, I went on, I was a college cheerleader. I then went on and I was an NFL cheerleader and I was the head cheerleader for the Washington Redskins. And she said it with such pride. And she said, that is my story. And here she got to where I got, yet I look back and tried to hide those pieces of myself. And that's embarrassing. And I want to help others know that you don't have to hide pieces of yourself. Every experience is a part of your journey, right? It's a part of your journey that made you who you are. And so the more you own it, the less disconnected you'll be from others. Totally. I love that part that you shared with your story. And it's reminding me, I heard Michelle Obama speak uh, probably around three years ago. And I mean, everything she said, I was hanging off every word. But one of the things that really landed for me was that part too. She said, your story. There's no right or wrong, all your imperfections, everything that happens along your journey. That's what you want to be telling the world. That's what helps people connect to you. And I think you did such a brilliant job with the different leaders you interviewed with them, even recognizing there were times that they held back aspects of their story. And then they realized through sharing those parts, it actually made people, first of all, have a little bit more humility and a bit more trust, like, Oh, you've been here, you've, you've had challenges, you failed along and don't have this, this belief that somehow they're a leader up here. And, um, they, they didn't get there from having any setbacks. It's almost like, and I guess this is also speaking to the part where you said around the perfection that that doesn't serve anybody to be trying to keep the story hidden. It actually creates so much connection. You are so right. And I just launched the second episode of my brand new podcast today with Kenneth Polite. And he's one of the leaders that I included in my book. And he was the U.S. attorney here in New Orleans. And now he's under Joe Biden. He's the second in command 
in the US Department of Justice. So he's in charge of the entire criminal division. He has thousands around the world under him. And when I, when I interviewed him for my podcast, I said, how are you doing connecting in your new job with all of these people? And he said, you know, he said, and, and I also said, have you always been so good with owning your story? Because he's very transparent about, I was born to teenage parents who did not end up married. I was raised in the projects. Very transparent. And he said, you know, one of my mentors taught me when I was a brand new lawyer, he said, the way that you get an audience to invest or your people to get invested to invest in you is for you to show them that you're not perfect and you're one of them. He said, so in the beginning, I didn't feel comfortable getting up as the U.S. attorney and sharing that my brother in New Orleans, my half brother was murdered and he was involved in gangs and drugs. I didn't feel comfortable doing that, but my mentor said, do it and they will realize that you are like them. And he said, and so what was cool about his view of leadership is he came into the U.S. Attorney's Office as, I mean, that office is a bastion of power. And, and it was very intentional. He said he wanted to turn it upside down. He said, I don't have to act as all powerful because the office is so powerful. I really want to lead from a place of true connection. And he was, the, I think, the first U.S. attorney to actually go into an office and say, I want to connect with the community. I want to connect with the people. I want to go and meet everybody. And he's just, you got to, you got to watch the episode, Kristen. It's a, he's an amazing person. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I thought so many of the leaders shared that and with their stories and their journeys. And so a couple of things that I want to talk with you about as a starting point, um, one of the things I still see is organizations are starting. I mean, they're getting there a little bit more around command and control is dead. It doesn't work. It hasn't for a long time yet. I still think there are some organizations that are tolerating some behaviors that are really not leadership behaviors, that there, there should be consequences, there should be accountability for this. Um, Simon Sinek and it's Simon Sinek and Adam Grant, or both of them call them the brilliant a-holes. Um, and we know we can like everyone in the organizations, like that person there, this is continuing to happen. You see, but, but they're brilliant. They're getting results. But as you and I both know, it's at a huge, huge cost to the organization, tangible and intangible. So there's going to be a CEO listening to this today. I know they're listening and they're going to say, okay, I'm going to, I I do want to do things differently. Where do I start? What do you have to say to them? Oh, that's brilliant. And so I'll give you an example. Juan Martin, who's the global president of Kind Bars, is in my book. And I also recently interviewed him for the podcast. And I said, I said, Juan, so what are you doing now, you know, to connect And he said, well, what two levels, I'm going to share with you examples of connection with myself and then connection with with others right now. He said, when I was working for Mars before they bought Kind Bars from Daniel Lubetsky, the founder, he said, I thought I was doing pretty well. I was in charge of Europe and and Africa, the, the candy and the pet food. I was doing really well. And I was leading as I was raised to lead. I was I was raised in southern Spain in a very machismo culture and highly competitive, which I still am, he said, but there was a lot of bravado to that. And so that's what I brought to the table. And I thought I was doing really, really well, you know, he said, and then I got an executive coach and I was sent to the center of creative leadership and really had to do a lot of soul searching and reflecting. And I said, I realized I wanted to lead with more compassion and kindness. And yet that was a big risk back then. He said, but this is how the universe works so brilliantly. He said, is I gave my, it was a big risk. I gave myself permission. I'm going to start leading with compassion and kindness. And that's when Mars bought the kind bars and they were searching throughout the global organization for a leader who could represent kindness because he said, that's one of the metrics that we're evaluated on is he goes, I want 250 million acts of kindness each year. And, and, and I've got to be held to that standard. And so how beautiful is that? You know, he said that, that now I'm being rewarded for actually leading like that. He said, so fast forward, he said, now, what does that look like during the pandemic? He said, well, we've come out of the pandemic. I finally got to, you know, leave my little tiny apartment that I was quarantining in, in Madrid, Spain. I'm back in New York. We have our offices, but we've revamped our offices, Michelle, 
to provide more collaborative spaces because our employees, like the rest of employees around the world, keep telling us they still do want that flexibility. They like to work from home on Mondays and Fridays. We're asking them to come in to corporate office Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but we've done away with offices. He goes, I don't even have an office. He said, we want you to be in front of your computer when you're at home and you can, you know, put a stew on the stove and change the laundry and pick your kids up from school on those days. When you're in the office, we want that true connection and collaboration. I said, okay, that's brilliant. Now, since you're the global president and you've got thousands of people around the world, how are you connecting via Zoom? Because that's hard. And he lifted up his espresso cup. And he said, Michelle, <laughs> he said, I'm a European and I love my express. So my people know that when I have one-on-ones with him, the way I look at it is if it's a 30 minute one-on-one, the first 10 minutes, I lift up my espresso cup and we're having a cup of coffee together. Mm. And I'm asking about their kids and I'm telling them about mine and our summer vacations where we're getting to know, you know, sharing on a personal level, we're having coffee. He said, that's how you cut through and, you know, the, the Zoom, the virtual environment and you meaningfully connect. And I love that symbolism too, right? With having that coffee. And then it's like, you see that and it means, okay, here's where we're going to go now. We're going to really get to know. And I, and you use that example with your, your courses during COVID that you were teaching them. And I think you said that you got an award for that as well, because you were having that time at the beginning where you were asking people what's going on, how are you? And I think it goes so far. And, and also I think what's really important is the leader also, not only you're asking everybody else, but sharing, you know, I'm just wondering how's everyone doing today? Cause I got to tell you today was a really tough day for me, or yesterday was a really tough day. This happened now, all of a sudden people feel less alone and they're more willing to share. And again, we're, we're wired, we're wired for this human connection. You are so right. When I was just in Rome a couple weeks ago, I was teaching study abroad, our students in Rome, and one of my favorite clients, he's the chief financial officer of a big system. He said, Michelle, I know you're in Rome and it's nine o'clock your time, but will you please facilitate my my team meeting and and kick us off with a connection question? I was like, absolutely. So Friday night at nine o'clock, I zoom in from Rome and he goes, okay, Michelle, and there's about 10 of his chiefs on the call. And I mean, it's a financial, like the once a month financial performance call. And and it's hard to be a hospital these days. They have a lot of big issues, right? But but it really matters to him to to hear from his people on a a genuine personal level. And so he said, Michelle, what what do you have for us? And I said, well, I said, I just spent um, a really long time today with my students in 95 degree weather on a really stinky hot bus (laughs) and I said it was pretty uncomfortable I'm not gonna lie and I said but it really got me thinking a lot of growth happens when you're really uncomfortable right and so I said so my question is let's hear from everybody when was the last time that you were really uncomfortable and how did you grow from that and my client raised his hand he goes you know I never volunteer to go first He said, but I got to tell you, I just had an experience in a hospital that gave me this brand new perspective from a patient's experience that I have a whole new view. Another one of the the guys on the call is like, I got to tell you, Roe versus Wade was just overturned. I didn't even know it had happened when I was on this call. And now I feel not really well equipped with my, help me. I want more empathy. I want to be there for my female leaders. Kristen, it was really one of the most powerful ways to begin a meeting because some, you know, you had mentioned a CEO was probably listening right now, trying to figure out how do I connect? And and some CEOs might be listening, thinking, Michelle, are you telling me now I have to go around, ask a personal question and then, oh gosh, am I going to, do I have to then be their therapist? No, 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 no. All we're saying is, just you know, begin a team meeting like that, showing that you care more about did you meet your financial goals? Yes. Because a lot of CEOs and a lot of high-level executives want to begin their meetings with, let's go around, did you meet your goals? If not, why? And what are you doing about it? Yes. 
And that's just not enough anymore. And it's, and this is what, it's not an either or start people first, of course, we understand you're running a business. Of course, we're going to talk about business outcomes, but you don't start there. You start with the humanity. You start with caring for the humans in the room. You are absolutely right. It's that people first mentality. You know, I'm going to go back and revamp my MBA course for the fall because so much about leadership now really is about relationship. And even in the MBA program, people know that, but it's still so hard to deconstruct. What do you mean be good with relate? Well, what am I supposed to do? How in the world? Do, I don't have time for that. I just got off of a coaching call today with a leader who said, I don't have time to do that, Michelle. I've got too much stuff to accomplish. I said, well, guess what? You got to move slow in the beginning to move as fast as you want at the end. If you want to increase revenue by 30%, you're not going to get there unless you move slowly and work on your relationships with your people. And then you'll get the results that you want. So it's really, it's very counterintuitive, but you're right. So many leaders just want to know, okay, what do I do? And the best advice that obviously you're also telling your leaders is begin with the humanity, begin with, and, and, and a, a lot of these podcasts, people will say, well, Michelle, you're advocating for meaningful connection. What is the definition? And Kristen, I think I finally figured it out. To me, the definition of meaningful connection is, do you feel seen? heard, valued, appreciated. That's it. Yeah. And so at the end of the year, I'm going to conduct a bunch of pulse checks on the leaders that I'm coaching. And I've been coaching them on meaningful connection with their people coming out of a pandemic. And that's all I'm going to ask. I'm going to do a pulse check with their direct reports. Does your leader make you feel seen, heard, valued, appreciated? Yeah. Because if that, those four things are happening, everything else looks different. Everything else. I love that. I I'm, I'm going to, I might have to steal that Michelle as well. <laughs> and ask that yeah. question Because I think it's, I think it's really important. And, and even as we're talking about leadership coaching, as you and I both know, um, working with executives and, and for me, it's working emerging leaders all the way to the top. And I love that because they're in different stages on their journey. And there are also going to be people listening who are like, I don't really know what leadership coaching is. Like, I don't even know why I really need it. And so in your words, when you start to think about coaching, how would you describe it? What is it? I, I, I know it's hard because for me, coaching at its core is experiential and it's not something you talk about, but if you had to describe it, what, what would you, what would be the words you would use to describe around what happens in leadership coaching? Yeah, well, so the good news surrounding leadership coaching is that, and, and Marshall Goldsmith is my mentor, and when, he, when it first the field began, when he was profiled in the New Yorker magazine in 2001 called The Better Boss, his clients were really jerks, and the whole article was on how this executive coach named Marshall Goldsmith, you know, turns jerks into good bosses, right? And, um, and so back then, coaching was really more about rehab. You know, you might see Marshall Goldsmith in the hallways, and then they, they hop into the water cooler, the coffee pot, and say, oh, boy, what did somebody do wrong? Who has to get a coach? And to me, at least with the organizations I work with now, in 2022, it's the opposite. The, Warner Thomas is the CEO of Auctioner Health. And he invests a lot of money in leadership coaching. And so if you are targeted as a high performer and they want to retain you and you get to a certain level, then they will invest in getting you an executive coach so that they can keep you and they can maximize your strengths, right? So whenever I begin a coaching relationship like you, I do the 360 feedback so you can have all of this data. And typically that's the first time that a leader really reads how others perceive them. And that is a powerful moment and it's hard. My leaders tell me it's one of the hardest things they go through is reading that 20 pages of data of how other, other people perceive them. But with discomfort comes growth and you're uncomfortable reading all of that, but yet it gives you an opportunity to be even better right? It gives you this action plan, this playbook for what you should continue to do that's really working. And then what maybe needs to be 
tweak because you didn't even realize it. It just might be a blind spot, but now you know. And that's another thing that Warner Thomas said. He goes, Michelle, it drives me crazy when, when I talk to somebody and they say, yeah, I don't really want an executive coach because people are going to be talking about the things that I don't do well. And I tell them they already know what you don't do well. They're already talking about it. So why don't you have an opportunity to fix it? That's what executive coaching is. It gives you an opportunity to truly see 360 degrees of how effective or ineffective your leadership is. And it gives you an opportunity to make the tweaks necessary. Yes. I think you've described that beautifully. And I say the same thing, like back in the day, I think it was seen as remedial. Whereas now, if we look at the top athletes in the world, they have multiple coaches. They're the top athletes in the world. It's not because they're not ex excellent at what they do. It's that they have somebody to continuously help them grow, challenge them, hit their edges. Because from my perspective, those high performers, there's sometimes where they might Stay a bit safe. And guess what? They also have some blind spots that can get in their way. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I work with a lot of ambitious driven individuals. That's a beautiful strength that can also be a blind spot at times that they don't allow themselves to like slow down and enjoy life and be in some contentment and be there for some of the fun and the playfulness and the joy that also happens outside of work. Gosh, you and I must be coaching the exact same client because um, I just I just spoke with a, a number of his stakeholders today, and it's so interesting. That's what success looks like to them for this particular leader is their hope is that he's able to have fun and enjoy the wins and enjoy the successes. And, and this particular, he's the CEO of a big real estate development company, and I'm just one of many coaches. I'm his executive coach. He has a life coach. He has a diet coach. He has, he has lots of coaches because he's at that point, right, where he's done financially well and and he wants to be able to enjoy it. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, you, you know, I remember when I had a client and we were talking about um, the beauty of play and she, could, she was having such a hard time wrapping her head around. So like, what are we achieving here? Like, what's the outcome? What's the goal? And that we, and eventually, and she does a lot of play in her life now, but she realized, oh, it's just for, there's nowhere to get to. It's just to be, to create, to imagine, to just be in this place where there is nothing that has to happen. It's just self-expression. And I think sometimes, um, especially as you move your way up in the organization and get so used to adulting that sometimes we lose touch with that part of ourselves. You are so right. And, you know, I finally was able to disconnect last week. And when I do totally disconnect and I come back recharged, I think, gosh, how important it is for leaders to really take a week and not work. And we were scalloping in Crystal River, Florida, mm -hmm. and just spending, I'd never scalloped in my life. And we've got the goggles and the snorkel and the flippers and trying to find these scallops. And it was so meditative just to be drifting in the water with no agenda, no, and it was, it was, it's amazing where your mind goes and you can be creative. Yes, play is crucial, right? Particularly for creativity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're a leader and on the show, we're always talking about being a work in progress and constantly learning and growing. What are some of the things that are showing up for you now, or perhaps in the last couple of years that you're being aware of in terms of some of your leadership growth edges? Yeah. So the two things that really got my attention this summer is how important it is. I had not done a good job of taking vacations. I would go places. I travel a lot, but I would work the whole time. Right. And, and I realized we, our brains really do need to disconnect that and, and the power of play. I mean, I would, again, I, I mean, I was the, I was into perfection. That's why I dedicated my book to the city of New Orleans, where I live, where you don't have to be perfect. Who knew that this city would be a backdrop for my research that, you know, you really have to give yourself permission to not be perfect and to, to play and not work all the time. It makes you dull. 
And so I've done a whole lot better job this summer of truly taking vacations where I can disconnect and playing. Coming out of the pandemic, I think we're now big, you know, getting a big sigh of relief and feeling a little bit more giving ourselves permission that we do need to play. We do need to disconnect. We've been in crisis mode for so long, and that is highly stressful and really changes your hormonal makeup. So we, we need to exercise, we need to be healthy, we need to play, and we need to disconnect. Yes, I, it's so true. Our nervous system needs that break, right? And if we don't and keep on plowing through, unfortunately, at some point, your body will do it for you if you don't do it for yourself. And we don't want that. So anybody who's listening, this is your invitation. Go to your calendar and book some time off for vacation. <laughs> do it, do it. There's so many wins. Like you said, it's not just the fact that you're leaving, but guess what? When I hear people, so many leaders saying, well, I, I, you know, I can, I have to be available first of all. So you're modeling to your employees that they also can't unplug and shut down, but guess what? They also are um, become more empowered when they have to be resourceful and they're not counting on you 24 seven and they figure it out. So you're also giving them the gift to learn how to do that. And then again, everyone modeling that work-life integration. You are so right. I just had a call yesterday with one of my female clients, big, big leader. And she said she is at the beach this week on vacation. So she told her team that she is completely disconnected and, and they are in charge. And then the two weeks before that, They were the two week vacation block at her company. She couldn't take vacation because of family at that time. But during those two weeks, she said she did not schedule one meeting with her team, not one on ones, not teams, not anything, even though she wasn't on vacation because she wanted to give them an opportunity to strategically think. She goes, if that's a vacation block that our CEO put in there and he's at the beach for two weeks, just because I'm not gone, doesn't mean that, that, oh, so then my team needs to show up for meetings. She goes, I need to embed time to strategically think so they can reset. So that means three weeks. What a gift. Three weeks that she's given her people where she's disconnected and she allows them to disconnect. That's a true gift. Such a gift. Such a gift. Um, It's always hard for me to wrap up these conversations when there's so much amazing insight being shared here, uh, Michelle, but I always like to give my uh, guests an opportunity to leave the audience with a final thought, whatever is showing up for you. Yeah, I think that this meaningful connection, it really takes intention. It's easy to say, of course, connection is important, but are you making the effort to ask the questions, to go a little bit deeper, not make it just surface, not make it just accomplishing your to-do list, but are you really trying to find commonality and connection with your people that they lead, um, that you lead? Because that is what creates the psychological safety and the trust so that then comes high performance. So again, if you can just be a little bit more intentional about connection, then you're going to get the high performance. Yeah. So, 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 so true. Where can people learn more about you, Michelle, and your work? Oh, thank you. Yeah. My website has everything from my book to my podcast, to all the podcasts I've been on. And that's michellekjohnston.com. And it's Michelle with two L's and then one letter K and then Johnston with the T. And so it also has a way for them to reach out to me. So I'd love to hear from your listeners and what they're going through and, and what I can help them with. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast, Kristen. Thank you so much, Michelle, for everything you shared today. And it's been wonderful just getting to know you better as well. Oh, I agree. And to everybody, wherever you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're sending tons of love. Bye-bye.